Hi guys, welcome back. So in yesterday's lesson, we talked about triggering devices, uh, magnetic sensors, Hall effect sensors, optical sensors. Today we're gonna to talk about distributorless ignition. So how do I eliminate this distributor and get a better ignition system out of it? So as we previously discussed, our distributor is a mechanical device. So there's a few reasons why we would want to eliminate it. Um, for automotive purposes, uh, if you remember, it's distributing the high voltage to the spark plugs at the right time. Down in the bottom of it, there's a trigger device that is telling our ignition coil when to fire. And the very bottom of it is driving our oil pump in some engines, not all. So those are some things that, uh, well, we have to find a different way to do them. So those things still need to happen. We still need to get the spark to the right cylinder at the right time, but we don't want to do it mechanically. We still need to drive the oil pump. We're going to have to do that mechanically. So the engineers will make some modifications to the engine to eliminate that. And we're still going to have to trigger our ignition module to fire our coil. Uh, so first of all, our distributor cap. We mentioned that this thing can uh, degrade, it can crack, it can uh, become susceptible to moisture. The terminals up inside can get corroded and oxidized from the sparks inside. Inside, the rotor that's in there spinning around, the tip is gonna wear away from sparks jumping off of it. Again, it, uh, it's a plastic insulator that can degrade and it can let voltage go to ground. So those are two mechanical devices that we can get rid of. The distributor itself is mechanical. There's a shaft and bearings in here, or possibly bushings. And those are going to wear out. Those require lubricant from the engine, but uh, they're not going to last forever. So the shaft is going to develop play and that's going to affect our ignition timing. And then last but not least, where the distributor goes into the engine, that has to be adjusted. If the distributor is removed or put back in, that has to be adjusted to set timing. So timing adjustment is going to become a thing of the past as well. These are all things that we don't have to worry about anymore with uh, distributorless ignition. No cap, no rotor, no shaft and bushings to wear out, and no timing adjustments to make. So there's a couple of ways of accomplishing distributorless ignition. And the one we're going to focus on today is what we call waste spark ignition. And just to be clear, not every engine needs a distributor. You really only need a distributor if you have a multi-cylinder engine that's using one ignition coil to provide the high voltage for all the spark plugs. If you can uh, just barely make out here out of the frame, there's a small engine. We're going to look at that. This thing, by nature, doesn't require a distributor because it's a single cylinder engine. And being a small engine where it's meant to run uh, without a battery, it's meant to power some kind of small equipment, it uh, doesn't have a distributor, doesn't have uh, a, a conventional set of points. It has basically a little magneto coil right here, and it has a magnet attached to the flywheel. So when this flywheel spins, this magnet's going to fly past this coil. Magnetic induction is going to create voltage in here. There's a, uh, a transistor circuit inside here to break the field at the exact right time, and we're going to get spark at our plug right here. So this is distributorless, doesn't need a distributor because it's only one cylinder, but we don't use single cylinder engines in cars. Um, but this is, in fact, a waste spark engine, and I'll explain a little more about that in a minute, but uh, just to demonstrate how this thing makes sparks and then get it off my bench, I'm going to turn the light out. Or at least turn most of the lights out. And I'm going to yank this over and hopefully you can see a spark there when I pull this cord. And hopefully we got that. Alright, so that little engine only has one cylinder. Um, they basically uh, built the simplest ignition system they could possibly build. So there's no distributor, there's no battery, it doesn't even have points. Uh, and it's by nature what we call waste spark. What we mean by waste spark is that we send a spark to the cylinder 
not only at the top of the compression stroke, but also at the top of the exhaust stroke. So it doesn't actually accomplish anything at the top of the exhaust stroke, therefore we call it a wasted spark. It's just a, it's a spark for the sake of keeping the ignition system simple. It doesn't actually do anything. Fires it at TDC on the compression stroke. It actually fires it at nearly TDC. We'll talk about that in another lesson this week about timing. And at TDC on the exhaust stroke, which is a waste. So if you think about the four strokes of an engine, here's my piston cylinder. Your first stroke is going down, that's intake. Your second stroke is going up, that's compression. This is where we need our spark at the top of this compression stroke. The third stroke, piston is going down, that's our power stroke. And then our last Stroke, our piston's going back up again. That's our exhaust stroke. So basically, every time that piston comes up to top dead center, we're going to send a spark there, whether we need it or not. That simplicity helps us eliminate some pieces from the system that we would otherwise need, it makes the system cheap and simple. Okay, so when you think about top of that exhaust stroke, what we just did is we just finished the exhaust stroke. That piston just went up. It blew out all the spent gases out the exhaust valve and out into the tailpipe. There's basically nothing left up in that cylinder, and there's also no pressure in that cylinder. So we'll come back to that again. That's going to become important. Okay, so if you remember back to a previous lesson, an ignition coil, well, the one I showed you before looks like this. So they call this a canister style coil. This one with the yellow top and the primary terminals close to each other is kind of distinctive. That's, a, that's an old Ford coil. So this is my low voltage coming in, building up the field on the primary circuit. The high voltage will be coming out that terminal there, and that would be the secondary terminal or the secondary circuit. And that's going to go out to the uh, middle of our distributor to be sent around for the spark plugs. So if I got rid of the distributor, I can't use one coil anymore to fire all the plugs. I need more coils. So there's a couple of ways of doing this. I could actually use a single coil for every single spark plug, uh, but that becomes complicated and expensive, so we'll talk about that later. Waste spark is a way of getting rid of the distributor on a multi-cylinder engine and kind of doing it on the cheap. So our primary circuit used to look like this. Here's our battery. Here's our ignition switch. Negative side of the battery grounds. This would be the primary side of my coil. This would be my switching device, and there's ground. So that switching device is going to be part of my ignition control module or my ICM because we're not in the dark ages anymore and we don't use points anymore. Then inside the coil, your secondary winding would be right next to the primary winding. There's secondary. primary, in an old fashioned ignition system this would go out to the middle of my distributor or it would go to a spark plug directly and inside the coil this end of the secondary wire or winding would be connected right there. So if we close our ignition switch and we start this car, as this little ignition control module transistor turns on and off we build and collapse our magnetic field. We start making high voltage pulses in the secondary side, and that's going to be the high voltage going out to the spark plug, or plugs. So the way that that circuit is going to complete, we're going to arc the ground through my spark plug. It's going to be an ugly little quick spark plug here. <laughs> 
The spark plug, as you remember, is screwed into the cylinder head, which is metal, which is bolted to the engine block, which is grounded back to the battery. So the high voltage is going to cause current flow in this circuit. We're going to flow out the coil, across the gap of the plug to ground. At that point, the high voltage is used up, but there's still some small amount of current that has to flow back to its source. Remember that the source is the coil. So that current's going to complete the circuit through the battery and through the ignition coil. So that's how we used to accomplish it. At some point, somebody came up with this idea. Rather than connecting the secondary circuit to the primary circuit inside the coil, we're going to connect the other side of this secondary winding to another spark plug. Remember that this spark plug is also screwed into the engine somewhere, so it is also grounded. But more importantly, the metal shells of these spark plugs are connected to each other through the metal of the engine. So what happens now, when my ignition control module completes the circuit, breaks the circuit, and induces high voltage into the secondary, is the current will flow out the coil on one side, jump the gap at one spark plug, flow through the metal of the cylinder head, jump the gap backwards at the other spark plug, and flow back to the coil to complete its circuit. So what we just accomplished is we fired two plugs with one coil. So if you have an engine with an even number of cylinders, a four cylinder engine, a six, an eight, you guys obviously know what even numbers are. This type of ignition system can be employed and we can get rid of a distributor for kind of cheap. Because for a four cylinder engine, I would need two coils. For a six cylinder engine, I would need three. And for an eight cylinder engine, I'd need four. So this is going to require a slightly more intelligent ignition control module, one that can run multiple coils. But it's not going to require a whole lot of computing power and it's not going to require a whole lot of expensive ignition coils. Here's an example of a four-cylinder engine. I'm just going to draw the top view of the engine. Here's a coil. Here's another coil. This coil is going to have a couple of spark plug wires going to a couple of spark plugs. This coil is going to have a couple of spark plug wires going to the other two spark plugs. Both of these coils are going to have a positive wire from the battery on the primary side. And both of these coils are going to have a ground wire from the primary going to my computer or my ignition control module. And that's what's going to be supplying the ground to these two coils. There's my ignition control module, which I realize you might not be able to see. No, you can. You can just make it out. The sideways writing has to go. I C M. Okay. In a late model vehicle, this would be your PCM, your powertrain control module, or your computer. Uh, on an older vehicle, this would just be an ignition control module. So this little module that uh, I think you're going to see for the last time right now, this is uh, smart enough to control one coil. It's only got five terminals here. We basically give it power, ground, uh, a signal from a triggering device, and we wire it up to the coil. That's all this thing can handle. It's got one circuit that it can control. This ignition control module needs to be a little bit smarter. It has to control two different coils at two different times, and it still needs the input of some kind of triggering device. So if we don't have a distributor anymore, we have to give it a signal. It could be a magnetic sensor stuck into the cylinder head, or it could be stuck down into the block or it could be a Hall effect sensor like we learned about yesterday, or it could be an optical sensor. It's up to the manufacturer, whatever they want to use. So, trigger device is going to tell our ignition control module when to fire these coils. 
and then these two coils are going to supply the spark to these cylinders. So on a four cylinder engine, number one is usually over here, the farthest away from the flywheel. Cylinder number four is usually over here, closest to the transmission, two and three are in between. What you need to understand about a four cylinder engine is those pistons operate in pairs. And that's something that's also sort of important for this waste spark system. So inside a four cylinder, Number one piston is at top dead center at the same time as number four. And at the same time, cylinders two and three are at bottom dead center. They're all the way down in their bores. So as this engine spins, one and four will rise and fall together, and they'll be doing it 180 degrees opposite from two and three. As one is going down, the four is going down, two and three are going up. So the term for this is companion. These are companion cylinders. So two and three are companions, they rise and fall together. One and four are companions, they rise and fall together. The trick is they're not on the same stroke. When one is going up on its compression stroke, number four is going up on its exhaust stroke. So when that coil fires, this coil sends a spark to one and four. Number one needs that spark for combustion. Number four doesn't need it, so it wastes it. That's why we call it a waste spark ignition system. Crankshaft rotates 180 degrees. Now cylinder three is coming up on its compression stroke. It needs a spark. Number two is coming up on its exhaust stroke, it doesn't need a spark, but it's going to get one anyways. Now your engine rotates 180 degrees, one and four are back to top dead center. This time one is on an exhaust stroke, and four is on a power stroke. So the same coil fires, but now this cylinder needs it, and this cylinder wastes it. So we waste a spark, then we waste a spark, then we waste a spark, then we waste a spark. And hence the name, waste spark. So this is a pretty simple ignition system, it cuts down on parts because you don't need to put an ignition coil for every single spark plug. It makes the uh, computer kind of cheap, or cheaper than if it were to control individual coils. And again, just to sum it up, fires two plugs at a time. One of them is on compression, one is on exhaust, and those are known as companion cylinders. So this is really only a viable system for engines that have even number of cylinders and have companion cylinders. There are some odd engines where they don't have companion cylinders, where the firing order is kind of odd because of the design of the crankshaft, and we can talk about that at another time. But for a lot of applications, inline four cylinders, V6s, inline sixes, um, V8s is a perfectly good ignition system, and it's a nice, cheap, easy way for the manufacturers to do away with the distributor. So we're going to fire two plugs at a time, one on compression, one on exhaust. The next time around with the crankshaft, this one will be on exhaust, and this one will be on compression. And uh, it really won't matter. They're both going to get a spark whether they need it or not. We call those companion cylinders. And just to wrap up what you need for this system. Well, you need a crankshaft sensor of some kind. that to trigger the coils or trigger the ignition module I should say I should say so when we trigger the ignition module it's going to fire the coil based on crankshaft position it doesn't care whether that pistons coming up on compression or coming up on exhaust it's going to fire that coil either way uh, so we don't need a camshaft sensor 
You only need a crankshaft sensor. So again, this makes it kind of cheap and easy for the manufacturer. They need a crankshaft sensor. They need a control module. And we need two output coils. One for each pair of cylinders. So on a two-cylinder engine, you'd have a single two-output coil. Coil would kind of look like this, but there would be two of these secondary towers. On a four-cylinder engine, oh, actually I have one right here. This coil right here has two secondary output terminals. This is a GM-style coil. On a four-cylinder engine, you could use two of these coils side by side. Or you could use one of these. We call this a coil pack. So this is a Chrysler-style ignition coil. If you guys have, have been paying attention in shop, our Neon, our PT Cruiser, and if you remember the old van we used to have, those all had Chrysler four-cylinders. This is the coil you see on top of the engine. So there's one coil made in here that fires these two towers at the same time. So these are going to go to cylinders one, or, one and four, or two and three. And there's another coil made in the same package or pack here that's going to fire the other two companion cylinders. Primary connection is down here. My secondaries are up here. So, only problem with this design is if one half of it dies, you have to change the whole thing. I think GM kind of had a better idea here. Yes, Dale, I just said GM had a good idea. And if one of these coils dies, you're only changing this one coil. So, it was more like a modular design, kind of a good idea. If you have a six cylinder engine, Again, if it's GM, they would use three of these coils. If it's Ford or Chrysler, they're going to use this, this big three-pack of coils. So there's one, two, three coils in here, each one with two towers, each one going to a pair of companion cylinders. My primary connection is up here. This is the low voltage coming in. This was a pretty common Ford coil. This is what's in my Ford Taurus. This is in, uh, well, just about everything Ford with a V6 prior to the early 2000s. Another one of those coils right here. There's a reason it's not in the car anymore. You might be able to see here on camera. It's cracked, so this is going to let high voltage leak to ground, and uh, it's going to cause the car to misfire. All right, so crank position sensor, control module, and a two output coil for every pair of cylinders. So I actually had to do some research. I was curious who was the first to use waste spark. Believe it or not, it was more common in motorcycles prior to cars. Motorcycles used it first. Uh, if you think about it, a lot of motorcycles are two cylinders, three cylinders, four cylinders. This isn't going to work on a three cylinder. But for a two cylinder motorcycle, as long as the pistons rise and fall together, they're companions, they only need one coil. They're going to fire at the same time. For a four cylinder motorcycle, just like our four cylinder cars, you've got your outer pistons rising and falling together, they're going to be connected to the same coil. So I was curious what the first car was to use Waste Spark. The first time I ever saw it was in the 80s on uh, General Motors products, Buick V6s, and uh, then later some of the uh, inline fours, and then the Cadillac V8s went to Waste Spark. Ford adopted it somewhere in the late 80s, early 90s. I don't really remember when Chrysler went to it. But uh, I was curious what was the first car to use Waste Spark. It was actually 1948, and it was a Citroen. earliest example of a car I could find using Waste Spark. So uh, that was my limited research. I did that uh, earlier today, and maybe some other automotive application used it earlier, but that was the first one I could find. Um, incidentally, that car was produced from 48 all the way till 1990. So that's quite the production run. So if you've never seen a, a, a Citroen 2CV, look it up. They're, they're pretty neat. All right, folks. So that about sums up Waste Spark. I'm just going to give you a preview of what we're going to talk about tomorrow. Where we use individual coils. So, one coil for each spark plug. If you have a four cylinder, you've got four coils. If you have a six cylinder, you have six. If you have an eight cylinder, you have eight. If you have a three cylinder or a five cylinder, you have three or five coils respectively. And yes, three and five cylinder engines do exist. 
five cylinders are actually much more common than you think. Kind of a neat engine configuration. All right, so that wraps up the video for today. A little bit shorter than yesterday's video. I don't want to try to stitch together two videos, and uh, I'm hoping this one uploads a little quicker than yesterday's video did. So uh, stay tuned for the questions. I'll be emailing them out. Hope you all have a good night and a good day tomorrow. And uh, again, reach out to me if you have any questions. Good night.